Welcome, everybody, to the final session of the day in this theatre. Uh, we're here with Norvin Vogt and his uh, talk, Overcoming Barriers to Open Source Adoption in the Public Sector. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me here and thanks for turning up. Um, I thought I'd try and make the title not too controversial, um, you know, as in why the hell are people so stupid that they don't realise that open source is leading the way at the moment. But um, so, <laughs> see, see, seeing that my boss will probably see this online at some stage, we'll, um, we'll keep it to um, barriers to software implement, uh, so open source software implementation in the public sector. Um, from my, uh, you, you might have read the bio, it's not that interesting. Um, so when I was 16, 17, a bunch of us used to hang around in a two-bedroom flat and write some code, and we made some money. We didn't make some money. Then we all went and got real jobs. Um, since then, I've had a number of other open source startups. I um, was doing some open source um, business intelligence work with uh, Clem7 and the Brisbane Airport Corporation. Um, also worked with Logica in Scotland, doing, um, trying, to get a, um, trying to get the Scottish government, which is part of the UK federal government, federal, you know, whatever you call it, it's a bit weird, but um, to uh, adopt an open source um, contemporary workspace, you know, desktop sort of uh, environment. Uh, they put a bit of money into it, but obviously the proprietary guys won out in the end. Um, so I've been the Chief Information Officer at Townsville Hospital and Health Service for about two years now. Uh, before that, I was the CIO of a private hospital in Townsville called the Marta Hospital. It's not associated with the Marta in Brisbane, it's a separate entity. And um, sort of... Being someone who used to code, still codes a little, you know, I like to think because I do the odd Python script, I still, I'm still part of the, um, part of the in crowd. Um, and worked in infrastructure and defence and all sorts of places. I thought by the time I got to the lofty heights of being a, a CIO that I would be able to affect change in a way where we could move an environment to start adopting more open source technologies or at least open, you know, sort of open standards sort of approach, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be um, solutions driven. And so about a year ago, I started writing down on the back of my diary um, all the excuses I was getting from various people that I was meeting about why we couldn't do things, uh, it, you know, various options. One was, you know, using, um, using uh, LibreOffice instead of um, obvious proprietary products. I'll try and stay away from, you know, <laughs> Naming, naming some of the solutions that we all have problems with, but um, that would have saved the uh, good people of Queensland uh, quite a few million dollars um, through to um, even back-end stuff, you know, um, <laughs> you know, directing my uh, technical infrastructure staff to actually conduct a particular project and then them not doing it, for instance, um, <laughs> putting Snipe on, um, on Snipe IT on a IIS um, platform instead of an Apache um, platform that I'd actually developed. So I thought it'd be interesting. I've cobbled this together in the last couple of weeks. I was actually going somewhere else. Um, so this is sort of um, cobbled together as a bit of a, this would say, say, this is what we say sort of conversation. And the objective of the presentation is to give you guys an idea of the zeitgeist that you are challenged by, by trying to provide solutions to the, uh, to the, to the public sector, which in the end I'll sort of rant a little bit more about. I actually think has an obligation to spend public money on intellectual property that isn't owned by proprietary companies. You know, I know that's a crazy sort of, um, you know, freedom fighter sort of version of things, um, but I don't expect to get picked up by ASIO anytime soon. So, um, I'll go through the slides. If you have any questions, I really like running a fairly open sort of fluid discussion format. I'm not here to try and present a particular solution. So these are really just talking points, and I thought we could have a discussion. And like I said, the objective is to give any of you guys, I mean, there might be a few guys that are from startups or looking to start something um, after <coughs> your studies or your current um, employment um, to address problems within, especially healthcare. I mean, healthcare is a huge spend IT wise. I mean, we're spending over a billion dollars a year in Queensland in IT alone for, and I'm talking solutions, not mostly just, you know, sort of rip and replace sort of things. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, we have our um, room monitor here who's got the microphone if you can't shout at me. Um, otherwise, we'll hook in. So... Please do wait for a microphone if you've got any questions as well so that we can catch up in the um, I was hoping a bit of a drum roll, but basically 10 barriers to open source adoption in the public sector. So I, I, 
the tallying got a little bit silly towards the end. So um, I think the first one ended up at 86 times and the last one was two times. So they are actually in order. And um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. Um, number one, difficulty. Literally, it's tricky for the uninitiated to use and the user interfaces of various distributions remain far inferior to those of Windows or Mac OS X. Uh, I'm quite sure not a lot of people agree with that in this room, but um, a lot of people out there do. Uh, the fear that users will find the digital disruption, and I hate that term, and I'll probably vomit next time I use it, but um, you know, it's what the public sector likes to use to describe innovation and change. There is a fear that if public sector organisations don't stick with proprietary solutions, that the change to the user is such a big barrier, or such a large barrier, that it will cause, I don't know, Sodom and Gomorrah or something. But generally, some sort of increase in support costs, some increase in loss of political capital, which is actually an important motivator in the public sector instead of commercial sector, because uh, it's probably well known, in, in the public sector, people mostly make decisions based around the political, cultural mix of an organisation, not so much the actual underlying bottom line financial reasons to do something. So I, I always describe this one as mostly being um, issues with uh, political capital and people not really wanting to upset the apple cart. Um, the example of this was actually the, the LibreOffice idea, which is um, currently patched and um, will be going out on Monday, much to the disgust of most of my colleagues. Um, because we, we're still using... Um, uh, sorry, just to give you a quick idea of the environment and how it works. So Queensland Health is the procurer of health services and there are 16 health districts, I think is what you call them here in Victoria, um, that provide health services to the department. I'm the CIO of one of those health districts, which we call a hospital and health service. I have between on a good day, 5,500 5, desktops, and on a bad day, 6,000 desktops. Uh, depends on which configuration database you're using um, and who's plugged what into the network that day. And, and Queensland Central Department, uh, Queensland Health, um, have a large IT capability. They run most of our desktops, they run most of our um, phones, they do the project management and government governance and that sort of stuff. Aside from that, all of the bespoke stuff that's delivered to the health service, that's specific to the health service, away from, say, you know, um, desktop operating systems and financial management systems, things like um, particular cl clinical applications or those sorts of things, that's the sort of stuff that my staff do. I'm also responsible for health records and for legal records within the organisation, so it's quite a nice CIO package. Um, I've got about 140 staff at the moment. Um, I only have 15 IT staff. The rest of those are medical records and um, administrative staff. So it's a very small team of dedicated IT people. So if you were to think of an ITIL environment, pretty much that third level um, application support, problem management, knowledge management, um, and some change in config release, if, if I'm talking corporate sort of jargon. Um, so when we want to implement a, um, a new application into the environment, we, we have a series of stakeholders we need to um, talk to. Uh, the central body being eHealth Queensland, which I just previously described. Um, <laughs> we also have um, our pathology, radiology, those sort of elements are called Health Services Queensland. They have their own IT staff as well. I then have particular institutes within my organisation that also have their own IT staff. So the oncology slash cancer centre has um, five IT staff. The medical imaging have three IT staff. Um, so it's, 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 it really is a menagerie. And having spent um, four or five years doing community development work overseas, I find myself using more community development principles to get projects ahead than, say, probably my technical IT sort of um, professional skills, if I could call them that. So this one was literally, um, every time I brought up um, using LibreOffice, because we, we have 5,000 desktops, the state only bought us 500 Office 2010 licenses in, <laughs> in, um, in 2013 um, to replace Office 2003 that's running on an XP platform. 
So we're currently spending $1.8 million locally to refresh our environment from being Windows XP to Windows 7. So um, you can imagine how innovative that makes me feel when I get up in the morning. Okay, the next one. Um, the default. Exchanging documents with suppliers or customers. Proprietary software vendors have gone into universities, trained students on their software, and <coughs> not identical in terms of functionality or user interface, performance, plugins, yada, yada, yada. Um, exchanging documents with suppliers or customers. That's an interesting one because technically Queensland Health's um, standard office offering is 2003. Therefore, mandating the standard or the, the sort of the house style that um, Office 2003 documents should actually be the default. Which isn't the case because normally the power users are using 2010 because obviously they normally have the political capital to rise to the top and get those requests in for 2010. So you have that sort of disparity in technology which is often the case in many large organisations. Um, sort of a, some sort of weird hierarchy. Um, and, and not along positions either, eh? So, just on the side. Um, and stop me if I'm whinging, because I know I've got a certain amount of time. But, um, you know, th there are particular people in the organisation that have, not, not to demean what they do, because they're professional people that do things, but they'll be fairly lowly ranked in the, in the organisation. And you wouldn't think that, say, a, um, a, st um, a clerk operating a logistical unit would require Office 2010, say, above a, um, an executive assistance officer of say one of our senior execs, not that they're any more important, but you would have expected some sort of you know political game to have played. Um, but yeah, it's random people just get, yeah, and it's 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 interesting. So what that means is that we actually have people that can't open documents because a lot of people are saving in 2010. They only have 2003. I would have thought that the automatic uh, solution to that is to use Libre or Open or or um, or any of the other sort of forked um, Open Office uh, derivatives because obviously then you can deal with all formats and those sorts of things. But the fear that users won't actually, this goes back to the other one, the fear that users won't actually um, change their settings so that um, they're using the default 2003 is the reason why we decide not to actually roll out LibreOffice in the first place. Everyone there can see the catch-22 because at the moment people aren't doing that anyway with a proprietary product. So I find that a difficult one to get over and I've tried many, many arguments. Um, proprietary software vendors have gone into the universities. Um, there's a politically charged one at the moment, which I won't talk about because it's not going to look good and there's going to be some money involved. But um, one of the, when I was um, the senior IT manager at an engineering firm in Canberra called CEA Technologies, um, a lot of the uh, AutoCAD systems, and um, that's actually a proprietary term, isn't it? But you know, all, all of the computer-aided um, design packages there was one particular vendor that basically owns 80% of the market when it comes to um, students because they all learn to use that particular package through their university course and therefore to try and offer any other, because there are, there are actually some really nice open source design, maybe it doesn't do the whole thing but you know, various point solutions. Um, and you just can't because there's just a, you know, a default, you know, even, even more so than say people using you know, um, Microsoft Office. Um, then the third, the third reason we always come up against um, is that basically the, the functionality and interfaces and performance and every, every other excuse that people can come up with under the sun aren't similar to proprietary systems and that somehow the change costs within an organisation would be larger because of this. Um, having done many... That's actually quite ridiculous. Yeah, because see... Because if you try to write the markers in open Oh, just wait. Sorry, the, the, the macro system in Microsoft Office is much better than in OpenOffice because, yes, I know kind of basis of Python, but uh, every time I try to write the macros for OpenOffice, it's almost impossible. Mm. VBA, I, I agree. VBA is a very, because very... Because VBA, you just click the record macro, you then just clean it up, put the stuff you need, and that's it. With, my, with, with open office, it's, it's impossible. That, that, and it's, it, it would be absolutely impossible for the, the normal user. That is very true. But I would see that as a, as a, as a micro issue, not a macro issue for, say, doing a large project. Um, yeah, that, that's a long conversation. And we've we had a few times. But it's, it's a very valid point. It's a very valid point. 
Um, the the sort of the the, 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 the the argument I presented against that particular uh, one was that a lot of the VBA code out there within an organisation is not in any way managed version control, you know, and that sort of stuff. So the elimination of macro code is actually beneficial to someone in my position. Because yeah, <laughs> indeed. And but then to try and upskill your pseudo coders, you know, your um, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean as in writing pseudo code, but you know, your 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 uh, there's too many puns in this game. Um, the uh, you know the guys who are sort of dabbling with code. Um, to uplift them and get them using Subversion or Git or something like that and using some sort of central software you know, code management system just becomes an, a nightmare as well. So, yeah, in defence they try and lock down VBA code as much as possible because, you know, it often is often used for um, viruses and stuff like that. Um, this sort of leads in from the first point, support. Um, um, paying for a guaranteed vendor response is, is one of the big ones. Somehow people think that just because they pay a lot of money to large vendors that they will get um, the service that they, they, they want. And I can say you don't. Um, you need to actually develop a relationship like you would with anybody. Um, open source, free Libre, sorry. I, I know there's so many acronyms. I'm just using FLOSS in this one. Um, community responds very quickly to queries posted on forum pages. Dot, 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 dot. But there's nobody at the end of a telephone is normally how that conversation goes. Um, I don't, you know, people like Red Hat and stuff probably prove that wrong, but they're not normally in the space where you can, where you can engage them. They're, a lot of the things they're trying to do is not what we're trying to do. Um, and and, <laughs> and the, the old chestnut that comes up very often in, um, in, in the public sector that externing, externalizing risk by giving projects to separate third parties. Um, personally, and just Opinion-wise, I think that's probably the, the 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 largest overhead we have in the public sector with getting programs with getting any solution in place is the simple fact that the fat in the middle ends up being what kills so many things. I mean, um, you know, you're looking at say if you're looking at implementing an electronic medical record around the world, generally speaking, and I can give you the source for this data, you're looking at between $100,000 per bed and $120,000 per bed. So you can imagine a 650 bed hospital like mine, what sort of cost that's going to be. Now, that's not the technology cost. Generally speaking, I've always found across industry, and shoot me down on this because broad sweeping things never work really in real life, but generally in most projects, a third of the project will be technical costs. A third of the projects will, you know, um, the actual code, the, the, the software, the coders. Um, a third will be project costs, just the administration, governance, all that sort of stuff. And the third will be the, the, the change costs. And often the change costs aren't actually put into the solution proposal. But within health, you, that sort of screws out from, skews out from being 33% equally to um, basically being sort of the technology cost is around about 10%. The project costs end up about being 40% of the cost of the solution, and then the change cost ends up being about 50% of the solution. And so, that, so that's why when you start implementing things like electronic medical record systems, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to implement systems that aren't really that complicated, even though people like to think they are. Or sh should say, no more complicated than, say, a, a large ERP system in a corporate environment. But then again, there's been plenty of SAP projects that have gone left, right and centre, in including Queensland payroll. So I guess I don't really have a strong... Um, <laughs> strong... Uh, Position. Um, longevity. Um, having been a open source uh, supplier to government and to large organisations, the the big one is always the uh, there's no guarantee there's no guarantee that a proprietary software vendor will stick with a product. Um, also, read there is no guarantee that a software that an open source vendor will stick with a product. Um, the dot 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 that comes after that is, but. Um, at least they're a commercial entity and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We can sue them if we have to. Not the public sector ever has done that that I know of successfully. Um, hence the IBM payroll comment previously. Um, yeah, there's, there's a general misconception that open source people are fly-by-nighters, that there's no sort of commercial rigour behind what they do and how they do things. Admittingly, because generally the, the community and the sector, uh, which are quite different, um, 
the startups are wherever there's going to be innovation, you're going to have small people that are not in large companies and doing those sorts of things. So it, it becomes a counterintuitive argument. Um, if a fl floss project is small, there's no danger that the person behind, sorry, I think I read that, wrote that wrong. But anyway, basically, if there's, it, is that people believe that community projects will sort of run out of steam. And it's, and it's one that you can give to them because if anybody gets on, I don't know, SourceForge or those sorts of places, the amount of orphaned and abandoned um, open source projects that are out there are, are numerous. So probably within, probably a responsible for us, the community needs to do is projects that have been orphaned and aren't going anywhere should probably be put to death. You know, they, they probably need to be killed in some way. Um, probably a controversial thought, but... Um, and that's only a part of that, what forms that particular opinion. But it, it's, it's a really big one, is the fact that people believe that, you know, for, I mean, first they've made the, 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 they've stuck with the idea that basically, you know, there's no real commercial organisations that do it, rah, rah, it's only community based that do these things and they're just a bunch of uni students that will leave it when they find a real job. That's, that seems to be the main, the main thing that I've always come up against with um, trying to get solutions in place. Um, uh, the misconception that large, large vendors are likely to be around in a few years to honour their commitments they give you. Um, I <laughs> Very well done. They require to sell you a new version. Exactly right. Um, uh, version creep, scope creep, whatever you want to call it, is a, is a big, is a big um, problem. But um, like many of our large projects in, in Queensland and in, in Australia, you know, it's the old saying, nobody ever got sacked for hiring IBM. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, irony in that is just beautiful. Um, the cloud. So, um, uh, often, obviously, a lot of the SaaS solutions out there are built on uh, open source technologies, you know, Apache, that sort of stuff. Um, and it's like it's some sort of religious debate sometimes that, you know, the amount of times I've heard, you know, Norvin, just because it's, you know, just because it's open source, just because they're using open source doesn't mean that the proprietor is actually open source or is following open standards. And that's actually very true. The flip side of that is, is that if we, if we are to use, if, if we were more, if we, were, if we were more ready to use small, SaaS providers and small um, startups, even if their end product isn't open source in the sort of, the, I don't know, the gold standard um, idea, you're still encouraging the peripheral, peripheral uh, you're still encouraging more people to use open source and open source packages and that sort of stuff. And you're not obviously getting stuck with, if the solution doesn't go anywhere, you've suddenly got to bring it in-house and need to set up, I don't know, an Oracle database because that's what that particular provider wanted to use. Um, and the second one there, the benefits of using cloud solution as a service model often outweigh the disadvantages of not having access to the source code. Um, as in, that's their argument um, because it's all care and no responsibility. And that's another big, huge underlying mind zeitgeist within, within the public sector is that um, we've put all the governance in place. We're not going to get sacked and the Royal Commission isn't going to find anything against us when there is one. Um, and we've got an SLA in place, so it's all good. So we don't need to do open source because... But then again, that's then counter against some of the arguments they were using previously. And you can see the underlying theme. There's re rarely a continuity of, of argument or logic within trying to stop particular solutions at small, large or medium sizes. Um, closed hardware, um, uh, specialised drivers, uh, closed source, um, even if you did have open source developers, they don't normally get access to um, the hardware for testing and those sorts of things. Um, the, vendor, <laughs> the vendor absolutely needs 24-7 remote access to your network because they just might have to fix something. Which is, which is sort of part of those other three things, is that because they lock it up, it's theirs, it's a black box sitting on your network, you're absolutely dependent on people to be able to come into your network and fix it at the slightest notice because somehow this piece of equipment will kill somebody. 
well, generally it's people who kill people, not machines. But um, the reason why this is a huge one is, moving aside from CEA technologies and the engineering stuff, because that's a whole different world, most of the innovation within healthcare in the next 10, 15 years, I mean, you use Gartner if you believe them, or you use um, some of the other guys, it's going to be M Health and E Health. And M Health is, you know, your, fit, your Fitbits and all the stuff that's running on, um, on, uh, on your, uh, your smartphones, right through to E Health, which is plugging stuff into an electronic medical record, sort of more of a, an enterprise sort of level thing. Sort of the space you see, so I work out of River City Labs in Brisbane, so. You know, that's where sort of like most of the contact I have with startups is at the moment. Um, if you look at most of the guys who are trying to develop stuff for healthcare, they're trying to get their hands on um, access to other devices. For instance, doing business intelligence or analytics, you know, pulling together um, patient vital signs to produce some sort of um, patient friendly portal, for instance. Very big market at the moment. Um, they, they just don't get access to what they require because of the closed architecture and the closed um, nature of these, these, these boxes. And what's interesting is, and I, I won't quote any particular vendor or any percentage, but if you look at the actual percentages of, say, say uh, you know, your standard cuff machine that, um, that takes your blood pressure, your proprietary products generally have a 30-ish percent error rate in them because they have a standard algorithm that's applied to everybody whether you're a pygmy from, um, from Africa or if you're some basketball player from, from New York, they sort of calculate the algorithm based on a sort of total volume of, of, one, of an average person, which generally happens to be more Eurasian sort of, you know, sort of semi, you know, mid-sized person. So it's funny that with all their technology and, uh, and access to all of their data and their analytics and stuff, they're still producing algorithms that aren't as accurate as they could be. And there's products at the moment that are, that are taking care of that. And the argument against a lot of the M Health stuff is that, you know, your fixed bits, those sort of things, is that they're inaccurate. And they will be un inaccurate because they don't have the same sort of rigor to what the vendors have. But it's funny that they share the same problem. Um, one of the best things I saw in America last year was, um, just on a side note, is there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of guys and what they do is they, um, they get a doctor to do, to do it properly, the systolic and stuff with a proper... Um, stethoscope, they key that in and they key in your mass and then they actually have a very accurate one and then from there on in whether you stay a day or, or, or 14 days in hospital, your blood pressure, your BPO, all of that sort of stuff is far more accurate because it's actually of course baseline against who you actually are instead of just pretending that you're a five foot seven person who lives in Singapore. Um, liability. It's funny that it comes in number seven. I would have thought in a public sector organisation it would have come in <laughs> around about number one. So um, warranties and, li and uh, liability indemnity matter a lot to the risk adverse public sector. Never a truer word has been said. Um, many open source products aren't backed by a commercial organisation or commercial structures slash um, license agreements, those sorts of things, and artefacts to um, make, give people confidence, i.e. they're hard to sue. Um, that's not the case if you look at people like Red Hat and the big end of town, kind of call those sort of guys, but the smaller innovators, that's probably true. But that sort of if-then attitude to, if it goes wrong, then we'll sue, I find, I just find really hard to deal with because generally they don't sue. I mean, public organisations don't necessarily do that. It's more sort of more, in my understanding, commercial organisation that does that sort of stuff. But it's far too late by then anyway. You know, you're, as a CIO, what you get pinned on a lot of the time is, is just managing the performance of your vendors through the life cycle of a solution. So if you don't have um, reporting against what they're providing, you know, um, activity against incident calls, against tech tickets, that sort of stuff, actual active, men, active management of a vendor, then you're going to be in the same problem whether that person's an open, whether that team vendor is an open source vendor or is a proprietary vendor of the traditional kind. Um, <laughs> um, the environment is incredibly unfriendly, unfriendly for getting money to solutions providers. Um, often, and it comes in number eight, because uh, um, thank God free beer versus freedom is starting to get ahead. Um, why do we have to pay for something that is free, i.e. free beer? Um, 
so I, I do have a couple of open source projects that are going, and you know, I don't have a direct relationship with a project or, or a vendor with them. And I would like to, I mean, this is hypothetical, and I would like to, and it's happened a few times, and I would like to put, donate some money to that particular project, whether it's through a particular you know, source forge, whatever, because I like what they're doing. Um, you try raising a purchase request for that and finding what your accounting staff say to you. It's just mind boggling. You know, we'd, why are we just giving these people money? You know, why, you know, it, it's hard for them to understand that even though there isn't a fixed price for a particular solution and we've gone for three quotes, you can still provide financial resources to a, pro, pro, to a project mostly on the benefit of saying, well, look, it would normally cost us X, it's costing us Y, you know, let's do some sort of derivative, there you go. At least, you, you know, it's not the best way to do it, but in its simplest form, at least we'd be putting some money into the pockets of people who were coding away late at night and trying to get something up and running. Um, budget structure being um, anti-floss because the capitalisation or opera, opera, uh, <laughs> I'm not having a good day, um, you know, putting it into an OPEX expenditure. Um, you know, um, that sort of budgetary time, round about the end of the financial year, come around May, is normally sort of um, hunting season for your average vendor because there is an X amount of dollars in a budget. Natural, naturally, most organisations are quite, quite prudish with how they spend money. They save money away through the year and then suddenly, bang, budget's coming, got to get stuff acquitted, got to get the money out the door and get a solution in place. Um, Organisations don't really like to have stuff hit their bottom line, so they don't really like to just pay for something and you know it, it goes to the bottom line. They'd much rather be able to sort of capitalise it and you know um, <coughs> depreciate it against the length of time that solution is provided. But it's often very very hard to have a conversation with external auditors about the fact that the labour required to put a software solution asset in place is the the majority of the actual spend for that capability and therefore the, the asset is the capability and the, and the people working on it is part of procuring that asset. It's, um, I've got two of those at the moment. One of them is, um, like I said, about $2 million project. Um, because, you know, I mean the difference is, is if that $2 million hits my bottom line, I'm going to be $2 million over my budget, which is about 10 or something percent which means that I'm probably not going to be able to employ the people I want to next year because I've already spent, you know, it's all those sort of calculations. It has wide-reaching effects. Uh, uh, they're worried about um, parts of FLOSS being involved in a solution, um, for instance, using a back end or something, um, to, uh, to support clinically focused um, applications because, once again, of those other eight other reasons I've noted, I'm getting the hurry along. Um, I won't go through each of those points, but you know, there's basically that intellectual property battle that you have. Ten minutes. Oh, ten minutes. <laughs> um, basically, people don't, you know, I mean, generally, people don't understand um, GPL style licenses, you know, Apache licenses, M um, MIT sort of licenses. Um, so they don't understand that you, someone can own something even if you didn't buy it off them. And that just ends up being a, a large. Um, problem because then if we add to that, if we end up contributing to the, God forbid, we actually end up contributing to the, to the project. We're doing one at Townsville which is cool with the university, I can talk about later, but um, then isn't that our IP and shouldn't people be paying for that? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard one to win. Um, and like I said, this is more what I'm saying to them normally is about the fact that we, we commission um, um, proprietary organisations to provide us with solutions where we've basically done most of the hard work for them. They're either skinning it or they're, they're you know, whatever. But they're, they're only in the game because of those other reasons I, I, I mentioned, you know, um, liability, um, the, uh, the perception that a vendor will at least support the product through life and all those sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of... I don't know how random that was, but hopefully it gives you guys a bit of an insight into sort of the challenges you have trying to get solutions in place in a large public sector organisation. It's probably just really clarified a lot of stereotypes that are already out there. <laughs> but at least you've got someone putting their hand up and saying, yes, um, I suffer from it. Are there any questions? 
Oh, here we go. I should, probably should have cut it short. Hi. Um, I am a public servant and I'm wondering... Um, I'm a statistician, so I'm sort of at the baseline. I'm outside IT. How can I push and how can I make your job easier if I know there's someone on the IT side who is pushing? Uh, look, often um, trying to deal with people who are at the coalflation and the ten trenches is a hard one because you don't have the political capital necessary normally to, to, to put a, a large project in place. And we're probably talking about products like SPSS and those sorts of things, which we spend a lot of money on in public health as well. Um, I've seen a couple of real... I mean, it, it comes down to writing a, a good concept brief or a good business case. Um, a CIO will never really understand the business as well as someone who's at the coalface. And probably the best influence that you can provide is providing the, um, the key um, competitive advantage of why the open source solution should be chosen above the, um, you know, I mean, it sounds old school, but really that's what it comes down to. Because often what slows us down, like a lot of those arguments I'm showing, showing are hearsay arguments. So it's, it comes, it, when you understand the problem that people are trying to solve, it's easier to fight for them. Whereas if people go, oh, well, can't they just use that then? Hopefully that gets you a bit, hopefully that answers your question. So um, one model I've had a bit of luck with in some of the public sector groups that I've worked with as a community is uh, it kind of gets around a few of those points of the, the pseudo blockers, if you will, uh, which is arranging a sponsorship contract with open source developers. So you want to use a project and you want to contribute to the project, but you have that budget thing. Why should we contribute? I found conflating that with the support argument, you can kind of get a developer to be your point of contact for a project you want. And that gives you an excuse to find a funding you know, line item for them. Mm. Um, that, it's, it's a sneaky workaround, but it's one that I have had limited success with, yeah. uh, you know, depending on your organisation. It'd be the size structures. of the expenditure as well. There'd exactly. be like a risk factor in there that says, yeah. if it's less than, say, 100,000 or 10,000, whatever the discretionary level is, that, oh, who cares, we'll get yeah. that in place because we need it anyway. Yeah, no, that's a good point. It's a good point. Um, I was part of the Democrats in the ACT, and we um, put legislation through in 01 um, that changed the procurement um, act in the ACT to actually um, prioritise open source solutions. Didn't really, it hasn't really changed things very much either, and very disappointing. Hi, um, I've had some experience with um, uh, techno technology groups in health, and one of the problems that we've got, I mean, uh, part of it is stacked against you anyway. Mm. I mean, 16 different health regions in one state. Uh, and we have the same problem in, in Victoria, where we have parallel universes running their own networks, running their own solutions and stuff like Trying that. Trying to solve the same problems. Yes. And even if you bring them together, uh, RFC 1925 kicks in. Um, if you have a problem that's too difficult, you can always escalate it to another level of indirection. And that's yeah. exactly what happens. Yeah. It just gets lifted up and it disappears. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of other things. The, um, one of the things that... Um, that's interesting is a GMO in 2013 introduced ODF as the recommended standard for all documentation. Um, it's amazing how very few CEOs and others in senior public administration know about that at all. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, as you've said, the default is to run to a proprietary um, uh, system. The success that we've had in Ballarat with regard to open source has, and again, this, this is a reference to, to, in terms of public servants, has been GovHack. Um, we brought Ballarat, uh, uh, GovHack up to Ballarat and we've run it for two years now and we've got the city council involved. Um, they coughed up large amounts of data and shamed all of the other uh, public services into saying we need to take this seriously. Shaming is a very powerful yeah. tool. <laughs> so, so as a public servant, um, if in fact you do have GovHack in your area, basically what you need to do is make sure that they're aware of the open data process. Now that's not directly linked to open source, but the bottom line is that when you get it out there and they start... Um, you know, looking at what can happen in a sand pit, uh, all of a sudden things start to happen. See, I absolutely agree. I actually think our golden age is coming, and I know it's 15 years behind Europe, but, um, and, you know, I'm, I don't vote red or blue in a particular way, but what Turnbull's doing with his innovation stuff seems to be coming down through what I see through the Federal um, Department of Health as they're actually serious about this innovation, digital disruption stuff that they keep on jazzing on about. And I think we're at the cusp of something, and I'm hoping, maybe there's more hope than an actual reality to it, but I'm hoping that they're going to take it seriously because, you know, the mining sector's basically, in my opinion, squashed any real need for innovation for a long time. 
as far as financial goes, everything's about pulling stuff out of the ground. And I'm, and I'm hoping that this sort of investment in human capital is going to actually be the, the turning point for us and we can actually get some money and get our teeth into it. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. I think sometimes there's this thing I've been uneasy about sometimes um, in open source or in GovHack and stuff, the way we talk about the waste in government, even though it's not what we mean, it can sound like the language sort of, of austerity. Mm. But what that made me curious about is if you were in Queensland, you know, say, for example, during Newman's government, mm. whether those prevailing winds of like budget cuts coming down of, you know, like um, stripping costs and everything, whether that had in any way like a silver lining for your arguments about open source procurement and things like that? Really good question. Um, so basically reframing it, you know, with the 2% the, the dividend that we needed to achieve under Newman, um, how, how do we, you know, me as the champion of innovation, say, in an organisation and trying to find solutions for people, how could I market open source technologies in that sort of equation? They're cheaper, blah, blah, all those sorts of things. I had a crack at a couple of ideas and they just wouldn't float. People are more likely to do the average toe cutting, like getting rid of people, getting rid of, um, you know, colour photocopying, you know, like <laughs> marginal, marginal difference, four cents versus one cent these days in most, most contracts, right? That, that's the stuff they focus on. Because um, I lost 40-something staff out of it and those sorts of things, and we've got all sorts of problems, you know. I'm not going to go into it because I'd be sued. But, um, <laughs> but um, instead of going to them and say, look, give me 100 grand, I can get this solution in place, and, you know, especially BI. We, we know that there's inefficiencies in some of our activities, especially workflow, but we don't have the sufficient BI, to act, business intelligence, to actually work out where those problems are and actually hold people accountable, which accountability being another big public sector issue. Um, so yet we just we just cut toes, you know. We just, <laughs> just yeah, it's it's frustrating. I'm hoping that changes. I am hoping that changes because eventually you can't cut anymore, right? You have to innovate. Last question, unfortunately. Look, I'm I'm around t today tonight. I'll go to the, I'm going to the Electronic Frontiers thing. So if you want to talk about this stuff, I this gets my heart going. So. It, it sounds like you're, you're suffering a lot of frustration um, from a lot of different angles. Uh, and, and, and yet... <laughs> Understatement of the year! <laughs> and, and, and... Yeah, it does! <laughs> and yet, you're the CIO. At what level would you have to be to affect change without resistance? I don't know. That's kind of why I wanted to have the discussion, actually. I wish we had longer. Um, and maybe we'll do that at uh, LinuxConf next year. We might take the double session and have a crack at things. I don't know where you can, and that's what bothers me, is that... I couldn't achieve it at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the solutions level with being a startup, and I'm failing to affect that at, a, at, an, at an upper level. And so maybe, maybe you can't. Maybe, maybe one person can't actually make that much of a difference in such a large system like the public sector because when it's not about bottom line. Um, I, fear, I, I fear, I should say I fear that. That's what sort of bothers me and gets me a bit disheartened about what I do. Um, I think what um, one of our presenters, one of our... Um, colleagues here were saying was that the things like GovHack and changing, changing things slowly through the sort of the West Coast US model of, you know, just basically, you know, geek is cool sort of idea, I think that might be the way it works. Plus the fact that the government finally is, there's the, the big disconnect I see at the moment, you know, for CIOs and things is basically, and this is a large argument, is that you have governments here saying, we want to innovate, we want to employ people that can innovate, we want people that are out-of-the-box thinkers and can do stuff, you know, can code and all those sorts of things. And then on the other hand, they say, we can't employ these people, they're not around, there's a skills gap, there's, we've got to employ people from overseas. And that's because the package, i.e. the young developer that can do some agile stuff, doesn't suit the expectations of what they're looking for. And what I can do is I can change that. I've, I've been able to hire... Th so I have an internship program with JCU. I get 14 staff out. I get 14 interns out of that each year. I have them for four, four weeks. Generally, the majority fall out. That's just that age group. I was like that when I was that age. We get four or five that stay on, and we give them jobs. And they're mostly coding in open source technologies because I can't share proprietary stuff with the university. So that's in the GitHub. So that's one thing I do. I'm hoping that you know, on my deathbed, that, that's my legacy, so that when I go see Peter, I can say, no, I did good in this world, you know. <laughs> Guys, thanks very much for coming along. I'm around. <laughs> um, just type in Northern Vote. I'm on LinkedIn and stuff. Um, 
pop me a message or something. Always love to have a chat and those sorts of things. Um, if you're trying to get a solution in place and you're trying to pitch it to government, always happy to do some market testing for people. Uh, give you a couple of ideas on why things um, solve. I guess that's what was the motivation of this course, of this um, uh, session. But yeah, thanks very much. Thanks to the volunteers. They um, do this stuff for free and they do it because it's out of passion and there's a lot of guts and not much glory. Um, so thanks to thank the volunteers and the organising committee. Thank you very much, guys. And I feel, uh, more importantly, thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. <laughs> thank and you. Uh, on behalf of everyone here at LCA 2016, I'd like to present you with this gift. Thank you very much.